streets as the neighbours fight back. Neighbourhood watched at 10.35 here on BBC One. Tonight in Crime Watch on the Streets. The specialist cops targeting serious criminals on the roads of Humberside. Okay, step up from the, the groundbreaking domestic abuse task force tackling serial offenders. You're under arrest. And we're with the fraud squad as they uncover a counterfeit credit card operation worth a staggering three and a half million pounds. It's early October and we're with the check and credit card fraud squad, part of the City of London Police. Their job is to identify and intercept fraudsters, trying to get their hands on our hard-earned cash. It's 5 a.m. and they're en route to a dawn raid. The man leading the team has 32 years' experience in the force. As a result of intelligence received, this morning we're going to execute a search warrant. The information is that the premises are occupied by Chinese people who are using counterfeit credit cards to commit fraud. The team carries out operations like this on a regular basis, so each officer is well versed on what's expected of them. And Nim and Roy, if you can do the door if it's necessary. As officers prepare to enter the property, they've no idea that they're about to stumble on one of the biggest fraud cases they have ever investigated. They're all here, Governor. Yeah. The tip-off suggests that the occupants have been using fraudulent cards to buy diamond rings. So the priority will be finding evidence of the diamonds or finding the cards used to buy them. But they've no idea what or who they might find inside the flat. There you are. Anyone else in the house? Who else is here? Stay there, kick it. Your hands where I can see them. Put your hands where I can see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There appear to be four Chinese occupants. And if they understand English, they're not letting on. Do you understand English? Right. Problems with language. I want you both to get out of bed. Come out. Oh, word. A lot of stuff. The suspects are rounded up, handcuffed, and taken into the lounge before the flat can be searched. And even though they don't appear to understand English, by law, they must be told what's going on. Right, sit down a minute. This is a search warrant to search this house and you, because we think there's stolen or counterfeit goods in here. All right? You're not under arrest at the moment, but what I want to do is search the premises and we'll speak to you if there's anything found. So the search for the diamonds and the counterfeit credit cards begins. We get to find anything, but we're gonna do a systematic search, looking for the credit cards. Obviously being such a small uh, item, We've got to search thoroughly and everywhere. At the moment, we're a bit in limbo, so until we find something, we don't know whether the information was correct or not. But it isn't long before they know they are on the right track. <laughs> well, this is, this is quite good, because this um, is what the intelligence was telling us, that they were buying diamond rings. £1,899. Second one for £1,299, £2,499, Bexley Heath. Again, a different credit card number to the other ones. They find more than £6,000 worth of diamond rings here, all recently bought with different credit cards. It seems the tip-off was a good one. That's good, I'm very pleased with that. But where are the actual cards they use to buy them? And are they counterfeit? Unless they can be found, it'll be almost impossible to prove the rings have been bought fraudulently. 
The more they search, the more high-quality merchandise they discover. More diamond rings. It's quite an expensive uh, handbag, Chanel, whether it's a real one or not. We'll get to find out. Just cash? Um, so far, yeah. That's quite yeah. nicely separated, isn't it? Um, must be better around there, probably. Good God. Quick estimate in this room is about £12,000 worth of property recovered. So how has this all been paid for? In a bedroom drawer, DC Mark Bertolo makes a discovery that suggests fraud is definitely involved. What we find in here are um, written pages in books and notepads which are 16-digit numbers which um, we recognise as sort of credit card number amounts of digits. These are the sort of things that you'd use on internet fraud or telephone order fraud. No card show, just the numbers. I'm not sure I'd pay £960 for that purse. This is only a small two-bedroom flat, but it's filled to the brim with designer bags, watches, and thousands of pounds worth of gift vouchers. Each item is bagged up, recorded, and seized for evidence. That's so much. Oh, God, we're going to need a flipping van again, aren't we? Then, finally, DC Katie Balls finds what they've really been looking for. Sellotape to the underside of a kitchen drawer. Cracking. If you have a look at these, this is what we were looking for all along. These are credit cards that haven't been completed, so they haven't got any embossing on the card. They've got poor quality security features on the cards, such as the hologram is wrong, there should be um, micro printing on the visa, which I can see isn't present. And you've got two, four, you've got five different sets of visa card um, counterfeits. Absolutely excellent. Just what we wanted to find today. Roy, got a good find if you want to stop and have a look. Excellent, absolutely superb, as you can Just see. Just what we wanted. These are the counterfeit credit cards. To the naked eye, if you were uh, serving in a shop, you wouldn't know the difference of those. With these secured, they've enough evidence to place all the suspects under arrest. I'm going to arrest you all now for conspiracy to defraud. You're not obliged to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you say may be given in evidence. Does any of you want to say anything? No? All right, all no replies after caution, yeah? Then, suddenly, there's a commotion at the front door. Somebody has just returned home. It's the owner of the flat. The fact that you live here um, and the reason we've come here and found a lot of counterfeit credit cards and goods purchased on counterfeit credit cards, I suspect you being involved in that. I am going to arrest you for conspiracy to defraud, OK? All right, now, have we got a pair of handcuffs? Stolen goods worth more than £70,000 have been found in this one small flat. It's been a fine morning's work for the fraud team. Well, I'm extremely happy by the results of this morning's raid. Got stolen credit cards, counterfeit credit cards, loads of designer goods, and we've got five prisoners to go and deal with now at the police station. All right, we're going to all get in the lift. All right? Good. A long day and evening dealing with these because none speak English, so uh, all of them are going to have to have interpreters and legal representatives. So, uh, long day. Will the evidence seized be enough to put these suspects behind bars? Find out later. Coming up. We're on the roads of Humberside with the coppers who target known criminals' cars in a bid to stop them in their tracks. Second, our buddy arrested them both on suspicion of theft of plant. But now we're in the west of Scotland as police head for the home of a man convicted of battering his wife. 
Kenny McDonald is with the Domestic Abuse Task Force of Strathclyde Police. He fears the man could go further. The relationship itself is amicable to start, but it then takes on a bit of a dark side. He starts to abuse her physically and verbally and take photographs of an indecent nature. Hello, it's the police. Is there anybody in? Any time the relationship ever got to a stage where she would want to leave or did leave, he would then start sending these indecent images over the internet to her family to antagonise them. But the team aren't here to arrest the abuser. He's already in prison. They're here to gather evidence because he's due to be released soon and they're worried about what he's planning to do next. He has consulted with a prison psychiatrist and when asked what he's going to do when he leaves, and how he feels about his ex-partner. He said quite openly that when he gets out, he's going to kill her. Kenny wants to find the indecent photographs this man has used to blackmail his ex-partner. He hopes they'll be enough to charge him with a new offense and send him straight back to jail and away from her. It's a totally new way of combating domestic abuse, arresting and disrupting known serial abusers. Domestic abuse is a problem all across Britain, but some of the highest rates of violence occur here in the west of Scotland. No! I am not going to let you do this! Stop it! Last year alone, there were 27,000 reported domestic incidents in the Strathclyde region. That's around 500 incidents a week from a population of about two and a half million. And those are just the ones the police know about. It's such an abhorrent crime. Victims um, very often don't like to um, expose what's been going on in a, in a private life. Very often victims are, are dependent upon the abuser financially for um, the sake of children, for you know, childcare issues. There can be a whole host of reasons. And it's extremely difficult to investigate for all of those reasons. Please stop now. To tackle prolific high-risk offenders, Strathclyde set up the Domestic Abuse Task Force, a dedicated team of 17 officers, all with an accomplished background in detective work. Right, Sandy, I just know you're under arrest. It's the very first time such a unit has ever been put together in the UK. Heading up the team is DCI Peter McPike. Welcome to the uh, Domestic Abuse uh, Forum. The task force will look to identify an individual who presents a real threat to a victim or to a victim's family and we will seek to target that individual and arrest that individual for any and all criminality that that individual is involved in. The hope is that the team will be able to intervene before abuse escalates beyond control, as it did in the case of 18-year-old Laura Thompson from AIR. Her treatment at the hands of ex-partner Stuart MacDonald shows exactly why such a unit is needed. I can't remember doing nothing. Just remember picking a knife up and washing the pot. I started stabbing her. I think, I think that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And I just ran away. Oh, she was just a bubbly girl. She was just dead happy. She was always smiling. As you can see from her pictures, she's always smiling. Laura had recently returned to work after the birth of her daughter, Millie. She'd been involved with MacDonald, Millie's father, on and off for about four years. But he was a jealous and controlling character, desperate to have power over all aspects of her life. She wasn't allowed to text people, she wasn't allowed to meet people, drinking in pubs. She wasn't allowed to sit anywhere near a guy or things like that. When they were apart, MacDonald would call and text Laura constantly, demanding to know where she was and who she was with. Stuart again, he won't leave me alone. Just ignore him. You're on a night out, you're here to enjoy yourself. OK, I know. He unfortunately displayed many of the characteristics which I believe are relevant in this type of um, domestic abuse investigation. Eventually, Laura decided she'd had enough and ended the relationship. But then, McDonald's behaviour became even more erratic. 
and we'd just be sitting in a pub and Stuart would walk in and then we would all just laugh and say, oh, he's here again, because everywhere we were, Stuart would turn up. And we must just have been checking every pub in here to see if we were there. Because he knew she was moving on and trying to live a life because she was working and no. she was trying to achieve better things for her and her daughter. Is that not Stuart? Back to tenants, cheers. If I can't have you, no one can. That's the, that was his attitude, I think. Can we just leave? Have you got him to talk to him? No. I've got him to talk to him. Don't just... to talk to him. It's a deal. Laura been in with some bloke tonight. Ah, she's not been with anybody. She's cool. A liar. I swear I'm not lying. I'm going. I can't stay here. I'm sorry. Are you coming? Don't be daft. Are you coming? Some people may consider that this type of um, behaviour may be a, a sort of caring aspect to a relationship, but when it becomes almost obsessive, then that becomes extremely dangerous. One night in June last year, Laura finished work and headed home in a taxi. Main Street first, I need to pick someone up. Thanks. Even though they were no longer together, for some reason she agreed to pick McDonald up on the way. Day. Yeah, I was out all yesterday as well. I've had no sleep, I'm wrecked. You need to sleep. You going back to mine for a bit? No. The taxi driver was able to tell us that she was at some length to say no, that she wanted to go home, she was tired, she'd been working, um, but he was able to exercise again this, this, this controlling influence. It's for one drink. One drink, and then I'm going. Just pull up here, mate. We'll cut through the church to get to mine. Nobody could reasonably have foreseen the appalling consequences in that. I'm not staying all night, though. Why? Because I'm tired. What were you doing last night? Nothing. Because I've been hearing things about you. Hearing what things? That you've been sleeping with other men. Is that true? No, Stuart, I haven't been with anyone behind your back. Oh, they're not making it up, are they? Why would you say it if it wasn't true? I don't know, don't but I'm just Don't lie to me! I am Tell not me lying the truth. to you! Ah! <laughs> Stuart, get off me! Please! Leave me alone! Whore. In the investigation that followed, police discovered this wasn't the first time MacDonald had been violent with Laura. But thinking she could handle it herself, She'd never mentioned it to her family. Stuart, will you slow down? We don't know why, but MacDonald ran to his brother's house and then immediately turned round and headed back to the cemetery. Sensing trouble, his brother followed him. What's happened? Did you do this, Stuart? I hardly touched her. <laughs> Let me see. Come back to me and I'll get you cleaned up. He panics much, doesn't he? <laughs> Are you all right? <laughs> he thinks I've been with someone. I haven't been with him. What's wrong with him? Do you want to sit down? Where's Stuart? I'm, I'm going to go and get him. I didn't do it. I know he's not. It's okay, come on, sit down, it's fine. <laughs> Where is he? It's all right. Laura! Do you want. <laughs> what? No. Stuart, put that away! Please. I've seen the way no. you look at other men. I haven't stopped There's no this point denying it! No. Oh, Stuart, just leave it out, right? Come on, you. Keep out of it! What's she done to you? What's she done? Get out of it! MacDonald began lashing out, stabbing everyone who came near him. Stop it! Stop it! Close the door! Close the door, please! I don't know. Keep holding the door, please! Don't open the door! I'm not holding no. the MacDonald stabbed Laura nine times in the neck, head and face. When he had finished, he just walked off into the night. The first people that arrived could detect a very, very weak pulse. And there was some um, medical work done to try to save Laura, but really she wasn't going to be able to survive the injuries that she had sustained. Stuart MacDonald was sentenced to life imprisonment. No one who knew him thought he was capable of such a crime. Yet his abuse of Laura had steadily grown worse over time. 
It's this sort of escalation Strathclyde police are determined to crack down on. We simply have to reduce the carnage in relation to domestic abuse across the west of Scotland. In this last 12 months, we've had seven domestic abuse murders, and we simply can't let that continue. So the task force is in place to try and intervene to stop that before it actually happens. It's 7.30 in the morning, and Sergeant Claire Magukian is leading a briefing ahead of a covert surveillance operation. Right, morning everybody. Operation Magenta. The information provided by the victim that suggests the target is actively stalking her, following her to a place of employment, waiting outside and questioning other staff members as to her whereabouts. Claire's officers will split into two teams to stake out the suspected stalker and monitor his movements. If he does go anywhere near his ex-partner, they'll be able to follow him and, if necessary, intervene. The, the difficulty we have with this one is that the male resides nearby our place of work and could easily be going about his day-to-day -day business. Um, however, her perception is that he's there purely to see her and harassing her. The task force will often use surveillance to work out what's really happening in a domestic situation. They need to find out the truth behind every allegation. Meanwhile, in a different part of Glasgow, PC Chris Hamill is on the hunt for a man wanted for a string of domestic abuse offences against his pregnant partner. He's considered a dangerous threat and needs to be found. The only problem is there are several possible addresses where he might be. 16. The number are we looking for? Hello. Hello, please. It's here. You don't know. Does he reside here? No, he doesn't stay here. He's just my partner, say nephew. Okay. Yeah. We had information that he was here. Do you mind if you have a look about? No, he's not he's here. here. He can still look here, but he's okay. not here. Yeah. Just check this room. Yeah, Is that check, okay? Yeah. The gentleman we're looking for is easily identifiable. Uh, so we'll be pretty sure when we see him. He didn't have. Looks like him. Yeah. After a thorough search, they're satisfied the suspect isn't there. But this worries Chris. I wouldn't be surprised if they gave him a phone call uh, to warn him that we're on our way. We'd be lucky to get him today if he knows, as I say, that we're actively looking for him now. Back with the surveillance operation, Sergeant Claire Magukian is in position at the second observation point. We'll maintain observations on her arriving and we'll see what course of action the perpetrator takes. He's about five foot nine. He's a kind of slim to medium build. He was quite quick the last time, wasn't he, when he came out? It was, yeah, it was quite all right. Then, from the second car, Claire thinks she spots the man's ex-partner, but she isn't being followed. Yeah, I'm sure that's her. She's done that last week as well, wasn't she? Aye. Uh, she went across and she'll go down to Tesco's and do a bit of shopping. Oh, no, maybe not. She's going elsewhere today. As Claire waits to see what will happen, Stuart and his colleagues arrive at another known address for their suspect. Hello, it's the police. Let's have it close. Okay. He's been linked to this house in the past, but police have no idea if he'll be there today. Hello, it's the Strathclyde Police here. Can I speak to you a minute? Yeah. What's your name? OK. We're looking for a, a male named... Yeah, that's my brother. He's not my brother. Right. Does he reside here? He doesn't reside here, no. Mind if you have a wee look around? You can uh -huh. come with us, OK? No so there's no one else here just now? No, no. About, OK. Something okay. with that wife or something, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I can't say, you know. All right, OK. You got contact number for him? I had two contact numbers for him, but he hardly keeps them on, to be honest, you know, if it's all regular. 
You don't have a key for this? I don't. My sister's got the key for that. Where is she? She lives across the street. That appears to be a secure room at the bottom of the house. He reckons he can get a key so as we can gain access. Chris stays behind in the flat whilst his colleague accompanies the suspect's brother round the corner to try and find the key. Back with the surveillance teams, it's clear the man they're after is a no-show. There's no way he would get wind that we were doing this. No, absolutely not. They decide to call the operation off and head back to the station to regroup. It's been a frustrating morning, but they're not giving up. They'll continue to collect evidence until totally satisfied the woman is not under any threat. You know, if victims go to the, the police and speak about domestic abuse now, then, you know, they're going to be treated seriously and the police are going to respond properly and, you know, they're going to get that level of support that they didn't have before. You know, previously, it was probably seen as this is an incident that's happened within the confines of a relationship and who are the police to interfere. Well, actually, if there's a crime being committed, yeah, we will become involved. Across town, it's suddenly clear the suspect wasn't concealed inside the flat. The officer who'd gone looking for a key to the locked room spotted him and has called for backup. By the time Chris gets to the address, the suspect is safely in cuffs. I'm going to see you drive my car Offenders should not kid themselves that this is anything other than assault or a crime. The fact that it takes place with someone who they know, who they're in a relationship, just makes matters worse as far as we're concerned. Well, there, as you've seen, we've successfully apprehended the male in question. Uh, he's came quite compliant, uh, which is good. In fact, he appeared jovial at some parts. However, we can't take away from the fact that this guy has repeatedly caused grief to his partner. Uh, so he goes to court tomorrow, and they will deal with him from then. With the task force now in place, Police are hopeful that more victims will come forward to report domestic abuse, so that tragedies like the killing of Laura Thompson can be prevented. It is hugely important that people recognise the type of behaviour that Laura was subjected to and seek help as early as possible with a view to trying to reduce the possibility of something like this ever happening again. Back in London, the hunt is on for a very different breed of criminal. The introduction of chip and pin has significantly reduced credit card fraud on the high street. But with more than 30 million of us now shopping on the internet, online card fraud has become the biggest type in the UK. Criminals see it as a golden opportunity to defraud. But what they don't know is that DI Roy West and the check and credit card squad are on the case. Well, this morning we're going to execute a search warrant at a house in South London. The information is that a delivery is going to take place of a large TV. That television has been obtained using a stolen credit card. So once the delivery takes place this morning, we'll then go and knock on the door and hopefully arrest the people responsible for the fraud. We're all in position now, awaiting the delivery of the television. That's up to the uh, delivery company as and when they get here. They wait to see if the occupants of the flat accept the TV, which, after about an hour, they do. Well, the delivery has been signed for in the suspect name. The address um, is believed top floor. Now that the TV has been delivered and signed for, Police have enough evidence to enter the property and arrest the occupants. All units regroup for the search warrant. A stroke of luck, 
the outer door to the building is open, so the suspect in the flat will have no idea they have visitors. It's about, don't you? I'm Detective Constable Mark Batuello from the City of London Police Fraud Squad. We've got um, an idea that that television has been obtained by fraud, yeah? And we believe you have signed for it this morning. Is that right? Yeah. She's been caught red handed, and the police aren't the people she was expecting to come knocking at her door. Yeah, because I have the phone number of the person who's supposed to be coming in to come and collect it. OK. Because this is like... Can you show me where that phone number is, please? And I'll show you the phone that you gave me. And you're showing me this telephone yes. number, and this telephone number is it's the one Dwayne. of the people, His right? Name's Dwayne. The fraudster who ordered the TV gave the girl a mobile phone and texted the name she should use to sign for the delivery. I can't believe what this is just happened. I'm so stupid. <laughs> What name did you sign the order in? Although she's implicated in the scam, officers want to use her to help catch the man behind the fraud. She's got Dwayne's telephone number there. She doesn't know where Dwayne lives. Yeah, but if you um, just call him now, he would not actually be coming right now because he's um, supposed to be coming here, meeting me here. Right, so you, you basically were to ring him when it arrived yeah. and he was going to come and collect yeah. it. We're going to get him rung now and hopefully that he's going to then turn up at the premises and we're going to arrest him. That's the game plan. Using the girl to call him is a high-risk strategy, but the only way to lure the suspect to the property. We're going to have a, an observation post looking at the address so that we can see the guy turns up. Yeah, I'll just wait till the governor says he's in situ and then we'll make a phone call. Yeah, you clear R5, boss? Yes, yes, you are, boss. Tell me when you're ready and I'll uh, get her to do the call. With everyone in position, the girl has little choice but to cooperate. 15 minutes, can't you be a bit quicker? So I've got to go. 10 minutes, exactly right, thank you, bye. Yeah, units for a description. It's um, IC3 male. Dark skin, five foot four tall. Units respond. One person ain't going to be able to carry that, so we're expecting two, I should imagine. It's now just a waiting game. Doors seem better days, doesn't it? It seems our suspect has arrived on time. Is he downstairs? Stand by, stand by. But as the outside units spring into action, it's clear Duane isn't telling the truth. Get up, get down, get down. Now. Right, I'm DC, but down, straight up. On the floor. Move your hand. Get Move down. Your, down. Right. 
I'm DC Batuolo from the City of London Police. You're arrested for fraud by false representation. Are you on your own? Yes. First lie of the day. You were with somebody, weren't you? Liar. Off we go. You all right with now it? all apprehended, the suspects will face further questioning about their role in this online fraud. They'll add to the list of over 50 people the squad have arrested in the last year by intercepting the delivery of goods fraudulently purchased online. After a thorough investigation, the driver was released without charge. Duane was found guilty of fraud by false representation and the girl who signed for the goods pleaded guilty to the same offence and got a 12-month conditional discharge. It's March and we're with PC Stuart James and the Humberside Road Policing Section. Yeah. Yankee Yankee 07, Uniform, Uniform, Bravo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their job is to target vehicles with links to known criminals and intercept them. A11 Intel. It's a grey Mazda. It's uh, just going past the traffic car now. Intelligence has come in about this car. Police records show its driver is involved with the drug trade around Hull. He's nervous as hell. Shaking. Um, you seem very nervous, Christian. He's got a pipe on him. Yeah, he's got his words away using yeah. paraphernalia in there. The gentleman is linked to the drug scene. And unfortunately, we haven't found anything um, in relation to controlled substances on his person or, or the vehicle. But we have found paraphernalia, burnt foil, syringes, a smoking pipe, that sort of thing. But no, no drugs. <laughs> The man has no drugs on him, but Stuart finds an illegal lock knife in his bag. I mean, he's got a Stanley knife and all sorts, but, I mean, that'll be part of his work. What's he doing about the lock knife? It's enough to arrest him and take him off the streets. And that's what the team is all about, either catching offenders red-handed or disrupting them before they have a chance to commit serious crimes. Criminals always use vehicles to commit criminal offences. A car, a vehicle, is a tool of their trade. If we can target the vehicles that they are using, we can detect offences, we can prevent offences or disrupt their activities. Using their power to stop and search, officers arrest suspects for all offences they uncover, no matter how minor. Their aim, to prevent them from committing more serious crimes in the future. All the intelligence is analysed in this central control room. 24 hours a day they monitor the roads and use national police databases, CCTV cameras, tip-offs from informants and old-fashioned detective work to identify and track criminals on the move on the roads of Humberside. It's 10pm when Stuart and the team receive word that a vehicle they've been searching for is heading their way. Intelligence suggests that a BMW has been bringing consignments of drugs into Hull. The intel is they travel to York to collect their drugs, usually setting off about three o'clock. Police have been on the lookout for this car, but previously on its way back into Hull, the BMW has managed to evade them. Tonight, it's a different story. I've got him going out at 12.15, then he's come back at 21.44. With the target identified, it's down to Stuart and the team to track down the BMW and stop it. It appears to be heading for the roundabout. If it's in the vehicle, it's one of the insured. There's intelligence from the 13th of March uh, that is involved in dealing Amphet. Amphet, or amphetamine, is an addictive Class B drug illegal in the UK. Officers take possession and supply of it very seriously. 
So I'm quite happy to go straight in with cuffs then on that. If we have specific intelligence on a subject and that they may be carrying something that they shouldn't be carrying, we will uh, go in and try and handcuff them immediately, which then prevents any evidence being lost or tampered with or discarded. Stuart knows the BMW will reach the roundabout at any moment. All they can do now is wait. Gone it now. It's okay, mate, don't worry. The target vehicle appears at the roundabout. Officers wait to see which direction it heads in and begin pursuit. Timing is everything. One wrong move and they could lose it. No, it's not that one, it's the one in front. It's one in front. Keep going, Steve. Keep going, Steve. Sure, you're off side. Keep going, yes, I know that. Keep going. Wrap around it. Until he gets everything back to the other section 23 of the Misuse of Drugs Act, so OK. OK, do you want to step out from the car? They've handcuffed the driver, but is he who they're looking for? Right, what's your name, fella? <laughs> OK, mate. Just get over here a minute. It is... Driving, yeah. The intelligence was right. The man insured on the vehicle is the man driving it. But is he trafficking drugs? Is anything in the vehicle now that shouldn't be? Do you want to bring him to the car? Do you want to... Uh... I love him. I want to pull it out and empty it. Officers search the vehicle and find a suspicious package. What is that? No idea. No idea. Right, do you want to just open it up, Steve, just so we can have a good look at it? No, that's fine. Not a clue. Even no. though it's in the door of your car. It's shaking a lot, mate. Are you cold? OK, it'd be interesting if you can give us a quantity and what it is. I believe it's two Rubik's Cube sizes of substance. Good God. So I don't know if it's amphet or if it's crack or cocaine. While the drugs are examined, the driver is arrested. Once we have identified an offence of this nature, we get further powers to exercise searches at addresses uh, to hopefully find further evidence to support a prosecution for possession with intent to supply. But officers have to move quickly. If word of this arrest gets out, any further evidence could be destroyed before they get there. Which one, Di? Can't see the numbers. Oh, I've got you. There it is, with a bike in the drive, uh, Steve. You might have to get there a bit sharpish. When police arrive, they see a man through the window. He panics and attempts to hide a package. Apparently, down his trousers. My colleagues have gone to the address and saw a male, what they believe to be secreting something, to his backside. They strip search him and find a bag of white powder. 25 minutes later, and a whole stash of drugs have been recovered from the property. That's what we located between the gentleman's book cheeks. Also found a bag of tablets. Obviously, we don't believe they're prescribed. We've recovered a set of scales with white powder on. There's also a further bag of drugs, which we believe to be amphetamine as well. The man in the house is arrested. Further intelligence reveals he is a convicted drug dealer. Yeah, he's going to need a strip search again when he gets in and in there. Just hold on to that one. If the team hadn't reacted to intelligence that night, these arrests would never have been made. The, a little bit of intelligence has snowballed and we've recovered quite a substantial amount of drugs that, have, that were obviously destined for the streets of Hull that now won't be destined and being destroyed. So, it, you know, it's a good result all round. On the other side of Hull, PC Andy Stainton is in pursuit of a white van and a 4x4 Jeep. As soon as they saw his patrol car, they began driving erratically. Suspicious, he pulls them over. It's two vehicles coming over the flyover, not too happy with the close proximity of the vehicles. They seem to be going fairly quick as well. 
And as we're descending the flyover, the, the 4x4 over there that's quite clearly flashing the driver of this vehicle. As officers wait with the 4x4, Andy confronts the driver of the white van. Do you know, do you know what he's called yet? What do you call you, man? Yeah, Ashley. Ashley? Moss. John Moss. Ashley John Moss. The driver is visibly nervous. Andy smells a rat and checks inside the van to see what he might be hiding. Earlier in the day, construction machinery had been stolen from a nearby farmyard. It looks strikingly similar to the contents of the van. When questioned, the driver's story just doesn't add up. What he's saying is, he doesn't know whose van it is. It's been paid by somebody in Doncaster to just drive it here with all this equipment in. Andy is convinced the equipment has been stolen, but he needs more on the driver if he's going to be able to arrest him on suspicion of theft. He turns to his colleagues back at HQ to find out if there's any intelligence on him. A quick check of his license is decisive. He's disqualified as well. The driver is arrested. But well, certainly one in custody for suspicion of theft of plant, I think, at the minute, Dave. Theft of plant equipment, typically used in construction, is a lucrative business and last year cost the industry over £75 million. Low-value items are easy pickings for thieves who can sell them on quickly through the black market. Having arrested the white van driver, officers need to work out if the two occupants of the other car are involved. It was in the tranny van, Ray. They were flashing him on the way down on the flyover. No, it wouldn't. It's the lights on this and up. Oh, right, OK. Under pressure, the arrested driver hints that he knows the men in the 4x4, but they deny it. The van driver is saying a few little bits to me because he's going to, because he's shitting himself. OK. Now, well, this is what I have to prove, and you have to obviously say, no, it's nothing to do with you. The white van driver is taken away for questioning, but the officers have a problem. If they don't establish a link with the 4x4 soon, they'll have to let it go. But Andy has a brainwave. Kid, did the driver of the van have a phone on him? Yes. So I'm going to have a look at it just to make sure you've not had contact with the van driver. OK? He seizes the mobiles from the men in the 4x4 and checks to see if they've called the van driver's phone that night. If they have, he'll have enough evidence to arrest them. Now, we need to know if that number is Matey Boy's number They're in the van. They're interrogating that now. OK. Two calls to Moss at 2030. So they are linked. Yeah, so they're, going as well. they're persistence has paid off. The driver of the 4x4 clearly does know the van driver. He called him moments before the police pulled them over. At the very least, officers are able to prove that they know each other. Shake hands out, buddy. I've arrested you both on suspicion of theft of plant, OK? I'm satisfied you're connected to the driver of that van. That's all, you, that's all you need to know this minute. The driver? Yeah. What's that? I was driving that van when you were pulled up. No, you're connected to that driver. You're both denying any knowledge of that van, aren't you? Yeah. Just let me, just let me confirm, you know nothing about that van at all? No. Or its contents? Nothing at all? No. I don't believe you. My suspicion is, is that you do know about that van. That's why you're under arrest on suspicion of plant. OK, let's have a look at your pockets, buddy. Just step out, Cal. They obviously have questions to answer in relation to their relationship with each other and the fact that the stolen plant, or presumed stolen plant in the back, is going to be handled by all three of them. So all three are under arrest at the minute. The driver was later found guilty of handling stolen goods and driving without a license. His friends in the 4x4 were released without charge. We're back on patrol with PC Stuart James as he receives instructions to intercept the vehicle of another known offender. The vehicle is thought to be involved in Delta Romeo. Delta Romeo is the code name for drugs. And the driver being a male, possibly Stafford Wilkes. The driver of a blue station wagon, Stafford Wilkes, is a known drug user with a history of dealing crack, heroin and marijuana. Right, right here, right here. Keep going down here. Intelligence suggests he's heading home. Officers race to his address. Through the bollards, well, not literally. As they pull up, they see his parked car. He's still in it, so they confront him. Where did you just come from, mate? Just come from Leeds. Leeds? Yeah. All right. What have you been doing out of Leeds way? Your daughters. Your daughters? Kids are in Leeds. Oh, are they? Yeah. I haven't met you His story seems plausible, but when officers frisk him, they find a substantial amount of cash in his back pocket. How much? About two. 
about 200. But the officers know that Wilkes is unemployed, and when asked, he's unable to explain exactly where he got his money from. Suspicious, officers turn their attention to his car, and they immediately notice a distinctive smell. Oh, no, I could just smell it. Yeah, yeah, I know that, yeah. And it doesn't take them long to sniff out the source, a joint and a small bag of cannabis. It's enough to warrant a search of his home. Basically, the subject that's been uh, detained in the vehicle has now been arrested in relation to drugs offences, which gives us further powers to go and search an address, which is adjacent to his vehicle, which we're going to exercise now. But it's late, and Wilkes hasn't got a key. Can you let me in? Make sure you're decent, right? I've got people here. Come up that damn computer, man. There's people out here with me. I'm in cuffs. Right, we'll do all oh, love. Just calling him. Yeah, I've got him. Oh, he's in there. Just a little then with you. It's not with there. Stuff, I'm going in and uh, going to sit down there. Right. Where else? No, let's make it easy, mate. Right, where's the stuff? Now we don't have to go rooting everywhere, do we? Wilkes admits to having a bag of cannabis in the house, but officers know to dig deeper. As the search continues, they discover further evidence of drug use. We have a fair Jim, bit of cannabis bush in different amounts, in different containers. We've got a stack of self-sealing bags. Right. And we've so, also got a couple of other larger amounts of what I think is skunk and some scales. Officers also discover an ultraviolet lamp a device used in the cultivation of marijuana. But the house search fails to uncover any sizable stash of the drug. You got a dragon light. But then, in the very final place they search, they strike gold. In an outhouse, they find two mature cannabis plants, each about a metre in height. Can I put my hood up, please? Stafford Wilkes is taken for questioning. He was later found guilty of possessing a Class B drug and fined. From disqualified drivers to drug dealers, in just one day, the unit has made nine arrests. Nine arrests today, which is pretty good. Uh, our best ever per day was 14, which goes to show from a small team and intelligence-led policing what impact we can have on the city of Hull. With more than 100,000 hours on the road, these officers have made over 2,000 arrests and seized more than £2 million worth of illegal substances. As a result, some 400 years of prison sentences have been handed out, all because of intelligence-led policing. Having discovered an Aladdin's cave of luxury goods purchased on fraudulent credit cards, D.I. Roy West and his team from the City of London Police were faced with the daunting task of putting together a case against the Chinese nationals arrested at the scene. But they knew it wasn't going to be easy. The people that were arrested, we had no previous knowledge of them. We hadn't had any warnings, they weren't on our radar. So it was a complete surprise that we got the result we did. The starting point was with the items recovered from the flat. I think all the officers um, were quite shocked at the amount that was there. We expected certain things to be there, but um, certainly not in the scale that uh, we found. The total value of the goods seized from the address was in excess of £70,000, so it was clear that this was no small-scale fraud. It appeared the gang were using fraudulent cards to buy the merchandise, then selling it on for cash and profit. But how could the police prove it? Every single item had to be examined to try to work out where and when it had been purchased and what credit cards had been used to pay for them. Luckily for the team, though, the fraudsters had made a big mistake. Because we found the receipts with the goods, that enabled us to trace the shops where they were purchased. And not only that, it gave them the precise date and time when each of the transactions had been made. We then attempted to obtain CCTV and live witnesses to who may have seen the people buy these goods. They were in luck. Footage recovered at a number of these stores caught the criminals in the act and revealed just how bold their operation had been. This is the moment that one of the fraudulent credit cards recovered at the flat was used to buy £300 worth of gift vouchers. 
Because it doesn't have chip and pin, the card needs to be swiped and requires a supervisor to manually authorize the transaction. But this isn't unusual, as not all countries use that type of technology. Take a look at how composed the buyer is, coolly playing with his mobile phone throughout. There's nothing about his behavior that would arouse suspicion. So he takes his purchases and walks away. 20 minutes later though, and he's back, attempting to buy another 300 pounds of vouchers. But because it's so soon after the last purchase, the CCTV operative becomes suspicious and zooms in to look at the card he's using. Recognize it? It doesn't have a chip in it, so that would always be swiped. So the details that are on that card could be mine, could be your credit card details. If you were uh, serving in a shop, you wouldn't know the difference for those. As the cashier goes off to find her supervisor, the man becomes engrossed in his mobile phone once again. This time, though, his super cool demeanor does raise suspicions. As the man goes to leave, the security guard stops him and asks to examine the credit card. Utterly unflappable, he hands it over. But the forgery looks so genuine that the security guard hands it back to him and lets him go on his way. He's just walked out the door with 600 pounds of fraudulently obtained vouchers. But interestingly enough, it turned out that the people that were arrested in the flat weren't the same people that were buying the goods on the stolen credit cards. They were controlling the people down below that were actually going out onto the streets committing the basic crime. And that meant the suspects they had in custody played a far bigger part in the fraud than had first been thought. This was an organized operation, and these were the ringleaders. After six months of investigation, the team was finally able to present their case in court and reveal the full extent of the fraud they'd uncovered. From a council flat in South London, this gang ran a global credit card scam which made them a fortune. In just over a week last year, they plundered three and a half million pounds from innocent victims around the world. The suspects were proven to be the London arm of a gang of international fraudsters who were so well organized they'd been able to use cloned credit cards to buy luxury items in 27 different countries. Thanks to the quality of the evidence Roy and his team were able to put in front of them, it took the jury less than three hours to reach its verdict. It's been an absolutely fantastic result. Uh, four out of the five were found guilty. They received a total imprisonment of 18 and a half years. The advice I'd give to fraudsters is if you commit crime, we will come after you. The City of London Police are committed to detecting fraud, and that's wherever it occurs within the country. Police are still trying to identify the man caught on CCTV buying the goods. He's unusually tall for someone of Chinese origin, about five foot ten. If you think you can help, then call the independent charity Crime Stoppers on 0800 treble five treble one. If you've been affected by any of the issues raised in Crime Watch on the streets and would like details of organisations which can provide help and support, please call the BBC Action Line in confidence on 08000 839 839. Lines are open 24 hours a day. Calls are free from a landline, but mobile operators will charge.